Good morning, everyone. It's, it's great to be talking about resistance and change and all of the things that we deal with in education. So whether you're a teacher, a coach, administrator, whatever, I mean, even if you're not in the math world at all, that we, we encounter change and we, when we try to change something, we encounter resistance at times. Uh, just to start, I want to say that we have uh, on my website, you can go here to request a slide. So if you're interested in learning more about this, there's two things you can do. Um, you go to our website, which is mathleadership.org, and click on projects. That's going to open up the understanding resistance to change uh, bar there. And when you go there, all of the source material that I cite is available there. So if you want to do a deeper dive in any of the research that I did, you can find articles, book references, all of those things there, videos and everything. And then there's a place where you can request a slide. So you just take a sh uh, take, just click that, request the slides. I'm happy to share it with you all. So let's jump in. I'm going to begin this story by, te by telling you something that happened to me that put me on this journey to work on understanding resistance to change. Believe it or not, I was working in a school and I encountered some resistance. But it was resistance I had never experienced before. So to give a little backstory here, uh, I was working with this school to do both embedded coaching and then also professional learning in the afternoons. And this one particular day, we were going to be meeting after school for a few hours. And I was really excited because I had such fun math planned. And we'd been reading Principles to Actions. And we were going to unpack some of the book and look at how it connected to the, all the math work we were doing. And you know when you're just fired up when you've got a great day planned. And I, I walked in. And everyone's there. Everyone's kind of set up and, and ready to go except for the fourth grade team. They come in late. And one gentleman in particular, uh, who was kind of prickly when I first met him, he comes walking in and his colleague says, hey, hey, uh, did you remember to bring your Principles to Action book today? And he's like, oh gosh, I left it at home because I sleep with it under my pillow every night. Because it's so interesting, just like this work we're doing with Mike. Yeah, that's what I did. Like, are you kidding me? Like, did he really just say that? So in the moment, as I'm all excited, he popped my balloon and now, after the shock wore off, I then started to just brood. And so I'm trying to run this, this, this session and do math, and I can't get out of my head. I'm fired up because I keep thinking, like, you know that moment where, like, a, if you're teaching and a kid acts out and you're not sure how to respond, and there's all of these choices you can make. And, and so in my head, I'm like, I should say something. Should I check in with the principal? What should I do? And it threw me off, and it was actually a bad session. It was, and it bothered me. So I'm, I'm driving home. And it, it gets worse. So then I'm starting to rage a bit because I realized, like, I was ready to do some really good work with these teachers, and so many of them are excited about it. And this one comment derailed me, derailed the session for everyone. And, and then the next day I wake up and I'm still feeling it. And then I, I go to the full range of emotions, and then I start second-guessing myself. Like, am I really cut out for this work? Can I actually do that? Uh, so let me see by a show of hands, how many of you, have had a similar experience and went through that sort of a look at look around the room so if you see all the hands up this is the reality that we live in when we try to affect any kind of change that we're going to encounter this and it's so hard not to take it personally not to get it right in your heart and then get in your head and then to sec have you second guess yourself so you guys all have your uh have uh, had this experience i'd like you to actually think about a specific person now okay so think of someone who's who who you've who's resisted a change effort that you've been trying to support. Because what I want you to do for today's session is carry that person with you. As we start talking about ways we can work with resistance, of uh, how we can change that, I want you to think about how you can apply those ideas with this particular individual. Okay, so take a moment just to get that person in your head. And then our goals today is we're going to begin by reframing resistance. It often, we think of it in a negative sense, but what if we flip that? What if we, we reframe resistance in a way where we can see it as a, as a starting point? We're going to understand the change process and to figure out why change uh, causes these kind of resistant behaviors. And then we're going to look at strategies for reducing resistance altogether. So we're going to begin. I'd like you to turn and talk to someone. If you're kind of spread out, you don't have anyone near you, you could just talk to your journal or your paper here. But take 30 seconds to list every stereotype or assumption that people might have about someone who resists change. Go ahead.
Okay, let's call some of them out. Lazy, what else? Bullies. Bullies. They don't care. They, don't care. They, know they know it all, right? So think of these things, like these assumptions that we make. And I've asked this of lots of people. What are some stereotypes and assumptions we can make? And they're all the same kind of things. Lazy, stubborn, set in their ways, all of this stuff. So the very first thing I've learned in my research is that if we want to work with teachers who are exhibiting resistant behavior, we need to get rid of these, these assumptions. We're going to burn them. We don't need them because if you start from that point, if you start from a negative frame, your, go your interactions unconsciously are going to be negative. Your, parts of your body, your facial expressions are going to reveal those inner feelings that you have. And so as hard as it, as hard as it is not to go to that place, and go to that negative space, that's the first thing that I've learned and it, it works, trust me. So Elena Aguilar talks about this idea of the pitfalls of per perception. She, she actually says that when we call someone a resistant teacher, we've already set a divide between the two of us. And that's, that's when we do that, we, we're no longer in a working space with that person because we've labeled them. The same way we don't say that a student in, in class is a problem student or a behavior uh, challenge, challenging student. We say it's a student who's exhibiting challenging behavior. And so we could flip our narrative with these teachers and say it's a teacher who's exhibiting resistant behavior. But the other piece of this thing with perception, the pitfalls of perception is if we want to bridge this divide, if we have this interaction with people, uh, we actually have to consciously get to their side of uh, any issue and start to get a sense of why they behave the way they do. Why are they acting the way they do? What's the root cause of this. And we can learn how important it is because when you can get yourself out of your shoes and into someone else's shoes and really intellectualize and try to understand where they're coming from, it changes how you're going to be able to support them. And we can see this, how, uh, how this plays out in like Hollywood, for instance. So Karate Kid's the best example I can show for this to help you understand this idea of perspective taking. Um, any movie, any TV show, we watch through the lens of the protagonist. And so their friends are our friends. Their enemies are our enemies. We're rooting for them all the way through. So if you've seen the Karate Kid, you know the basic story that Daniel moves to California. Um, he falls in love with this girl who ha happens to be the ex girl girlfriend of Johnny. Johnny doesn't like it. They bully Daniel. And, and so in this story, we're rooting for Daniel. He's such a good guy and Johnny's such a jerk. We don't want, we don't want Johnny to succeed. So what if we flip this? What if we could see the story not from Daniel's point of view, but from Johnny's point of view? Let's watch. Now imagine if you didn't see the original, right? That's great. I encourage you to watch the whole YouTube video because it's hilarious. But if you never saw that, if you never saw the real movie, it would be really easy for you to see 
that Daniel's the bad guy there because Hollywood does it perfectly. They set this good narrative for us. Um, we see this too in, in places where we root for people who are really awful. Uh, if you watch Breaking Bad, like we find ourselves rooting for Walter White. Like, oh yeah, he should bury that body or burn it in acid. That would be the best way to cover up the evidence, right? We want him to, to cover up the murder, right? That's the beauty of Hollywood. But if, we, if, Hollywood can, if Hollywood can help us get on the side of someone as awful as Walter White, it can help us get on the side of people who are exhibiting challenging behaviors that we need to work with. And so uh, Marine, Marine Linker talks about this idea of intellectual empathy. It's related to perspective taking. But it talks about having the, conscious, the consciousness and ability to reconstruct accurately the viewpoints of other people. To really take time to analyze where their push points might be coming from. What's going on with them. And Elena Aguilar takes this to a, a level where she gives us some focus questions. She has a great blog called How Can I Coach Resistant Teachers? And there's like multiple parts of it. But in this, in this article, this blog that she wrote, she gives some good focus questions that we could use. So for instance, what experiences has this teacher had in mathematics and how might that be affecting his or her interaction with me? All right? Or how connected does he feel to the school community or the school leaders? If he doesn't feel part of the school, is he going to feel part of this change initiative? Uh, how comfortable does he feel being vulnerable in front of uh, his colleagues? Is that, is that a sticking point for him? Also, what other factors may be going on with him? So I want you to take a moment and think of some of these questions and think of the person I asked you to think about, your resistant teacher, the teacher who's exhibiting resistant behavior in your life, and think about what new insight you may gain from that, from going through a process. And I'll tell you this, so that gentleman that I worked with, um, as I started to dig into this, I, I uncovered a couple of things. One, he, he's not comfortable and, and not quite strong in math. And math puts him in anxiety zones and, and he has reactions as a result of that. Uh, also turned out that his marriage was failing. And sometimes we don't think of those things, right? That we're humans, like we're in the school, we almost forget that there's an outside life with outside real world issues that can make their way into the, into the school. And so if his life outside is feeling, is, is turmoil, and coming in, and now here I am trying to make him change something in math. Sometimes that's enough to help me understand, like, wow, you know what? I need to have a little bit more empathy for him. And I need to keep that in mind when I think of what kind of change efforts I want to I impart on him. And maybe I need to be a little bit more patient. But just that process alone will give you some insight. Now, that's one thing we can do. Another tool you can do to, when you're encountering any kind of resistant behavior uh, comes from, actually, the car industry. If you're not familiar, this is Taiichi Ono. Uh, he was an engineer for Toyota, and he designed what's known as the five whys method. Uh, this is a way to get at root cause analysis. So he designed it because if something fell apart on the floor, maybe a, sh a machine broke down, he asked his engineers to ask why five times to get to that root cause. So for instance, if a machine uh, broke down, they, they could say, why? Well, the, the fan bell broke. Well, why did the fan bell break? Well, it overheated. Well, why did it overheat? And you can sort of work yourself back. So let's do this right now. Let's do one with something, a story that you're all probably really familiar with. You might know the Titanic. So what happened to the Titanic? All right, so it, it crashed into an iceberg. It sunk. It was tragic. Lots of lives were lost. And a great movie was made. And uh, so we know the story, how it all goes. So let's go and do a root cause analysis of, the, of this. What's the first why? So it hit an iceberg. Well, why did, it, why did it sink? Let's go there. Hit an iceberg. Why did it hit an iceberg? Going too fast? Why was it going too fast? They're trying to make the, like the beat this time, right? Get across the Atlantic. So we could start going through. And why did they want to make, like, beat this record time? Publicity and stuff. So you could start go going all the way through and realize that one of the main reasons it crashed was because of greed. That, that they, they disregarded safety uh, for for publicity and for, for more money. And so we can get to that root cause. Now, we can do that with people too. And so uh, this gentleman, Sam, I'm just going to call him Sam, uh, is the one that was, was my nemesis in a way in, that, in this experience. So when I did this for Sam, this is what I did. I found that Sam, one thing he wasn't doing was any number talks. We, we just, just wanted him to do some number talks, wouldn't do it. So why is that? Well, I found out he's not confident in his math abilities. Well, why not? Well, it turns out he actually has had very little experience with professional learning in math. Well, why is that? 
the district actually wasn't offering any math during PD days, any release days. And so he's not going to take his own time to do math. And if the district's not offering it, he's not getting it. Well, why were they doing that? Why didn't they offer math? They were using their professional development days, their release days, to cover all the state-mandated trainings that they needed to do. And so we start to get to this point where um, we realize that, and then why were they doing that? Because they need to ensure compliance with state mandates. So we could actually look to see, Sam's not doing number talks, and it goes all the way down to this route where this, the school's having a really inefficient way of, of trying to meet state mandates. And so if we start to then work to take that cause out of there, so we say, all right, let's find another way to meet the, the, make sure we have compliance. So now district leaders can start using release days to do math, right? So now we're getting math on release days, which is giving Sam more experience, um, which is going to then boost his confidence. And then in the end, we get to this place where He's starting to do number talks, right? That's our goal. We want to do that. So one thing I'm going to ask you to reflect on for a moment is do a five whys right now with the, the person that you're thinking about. Think about what is, uh, what's the behavior you're seeing and why do you think that behavior is happening, okay? Turn and talk to your, your neighbor for a second and, and just what are some of the early emerging root causes as you go down there? So take just a minute to do that or in your notebook if you're not near someone. Now, something I'm going to say about the five whys, and it's a cautionary tale here, is you need to make sure when you do that that the five whys don't become the five blames. It's really easy to start to pivot from going for a root cause, systemic uh, cause, something that's, that's in the system that's causing that behavior, to pivoting to focusing on the person, right? So if I do a five whys and it lands on Sam's kind of a jerk, that doesn't help, right? So if you find that when you're doing a five whys, you land on a person, versus something, an external force that can be changed, then ask why again. So it's one thing that they, they caution. Anyone who does five whys will say, be careful that you avoid going down the blame place. So you have to really facilitate this well when you do that. So another way to think about understanding this resistant behavior and making sense of how to work with it uh, comes from Jim Knight. He has a much simpler way of looking at it. So he thinks of it in sort of two lenses. And he says people resist change often from... Uh, Two views. One, can I do it? And then two, is it worth it? So one of these has to do with confidence. The other has to do with value. So if they don't see the value in it, then the way we have to approach it is to elevate the value, help them see the value. If it's the confidence thing, then we have to work on that confidence piece. But either one of those gives us a nice way of thinking like it's either this path or it's this path. We can take it that way. We can do a deeper dive. So instead of just looking at these two categories here, um, Jessica Bone wrote a great piece called Turning Resistant Teachers into Resilient Teachers for ASCD. And she talks about the categories of resistance. And so sometimes what I ask people to do when I'm working with coaches or anyone who's, who's um, trying to figure out how to navigate resistance, one thing that's really helpful to do is start to think about the kinds of resistance we see and why it exists. Where's that coming from? So in the context of today, we're going to just, I'll share some of the most popular ones that I've seen, uh, and then we can think about how we address those. So two of the main ones that come up, and they come up together, is that teachers resist change out of a lack of confidence or a lack of knowledge or sometimes the lack of knowledge causes the lack of confidence. But for some teachers who are showing that, that's what it is. Sam I'd put in that category, lack of confidence was a big one for him. So, but there's other ones too. So there's resistance uh, by resisting the administration. And this comes in two ways, two forms. You can resist the administration because it's a particular administrator you don't like. So you'll see someone who, whatever the principal says, they're gonna go against it because they don't like the principal. The other kind of resistance with administration is resistance of, because administrative change. You know as a new principal comes in, there's a new initiative, right? And they're there for a couple of years. And a new principal comes in after that, and there's a new initiative, and you throw everything else out. And so some people are so tired of that sort of back and forth that we get that they just, any kind of administrative change, they're like, I'm not on board, because this is going to be gone in three years. 
Another one is a resistance out of exhaustion, that teachers are tired. They're tired just from their job, but they also could just be tired of change. Every time we disrupt their, their routines, we're asking them to have to think more about these things that they're doing that used to be really easy for them. And so it's resistance out of exhaustion. There's resistance out of lack of agency, which is not having a voice in the change process. And there's resistance to change in general, just any kind of change. I don't want to, I, I like my routine, I'm going to stick with it. I don't want to get rid of that. We have resistance due to lack of belonging, not feeling a part of the school or the team. And then the last one is resistance due to apathy, which is, they're just lazy. Those, all those negative stereotypes that we said at the beginning here, that's often the first place people go when they say, why is so-and-so not on board? Why is this person acting the way they're doing? I did it. Why is Sam being such a jerk? Well, because he's a jerk, he's lazy, he doesn't want to do this, all this stuff. We, the interesting thing is that we have a lot of different categories of resistance, and the least common one that is actually true is apathy. A the, like, apathy is, seldom happens. Believe it or not, most of the time when you're encountering resistance, it's those other categories. It's just easy to go to apathy first because apathy is easy. I can't fix them. They're lazy. The other ones require us to actually look at changing parts of the system. If someone's resisting because they don't feel like they belong, that's a tough challenge to, to fill. We've got to figure out how to do that. So I want you to reflect for a moment. If you have a, res a teacher who's resisting something or it's a parent who's resisting, any of these, these resistant behaviors you're encountering, where would you categorize it? Is it one of these? Um, and if it is one of these, what would be your first steps to try to solve that problem? And if it's not one of these, how would you categorize it? But it is essential for us to understand because the kind of thing that Sam would need around lack of confidence is not the same thing someone would need if they were just exhausted or if they didn't get along with the principal. And so the ways in which we approach uh, resistance to change and understanding the categories, uh, we then pivot to, uh, based on the needs of what people need at that time. And this is a great way that we can figure it out. And so that's a bit about understanding resistance. But I'm going to push on this a little bit around this idea of resistance. Is resistance always bad? We, a lot of you are here today because it's a frustrating part of your work. Whether you're a teacher and you have parents who are pushing back because you don't send enough homework home or the homework doesn't look like it used to look when they were in school. Or if it's a colleague that you're trying to get on board with something that you're doing in math and you want them to help. Or maybe it's a school, like that you're, you're working at a, a different level. Uh, so we see resistance often in a negative light. But I'm going to push on this a little bit. And I shared this story at NCSM too, so I'm going to give a snippet of it here. But... In, in my school, when I was teaching second grade, we were part of a regional school district, and they had a big change initiative in mathematics. They wanted to do a big systems-wide change, and some people didn't like what they were doing, and they began to resist. They actually started writing letters to the school board. They, they uh, met with the uh, PTO. They met with parents, and, and they got teachers against it, and it basically ground the whole initiative to a halt. And it may surprise you to know that uh, I was one of those teachers. Now, where did it come from? Well, let me tell you this. In the beginning, what happened was to announce this initiative, they brought us all into a room, all the elementary teachers. They sat us down. They gave us a math quiz, a couple problems, eighth grade math problems. And then we, could, we had to take it in silence. We had to turn it in. And they graded it in front of everyone. They put them in two stacks, one stack here, one stack there. And then you just sit down and you just wait. And already you could just feel the tension in the room. People, you could see hives on people. Um, people are fuming. Like, and, and so they then picked up a stack and said, this many people couldn't pass an eighth grade math test. And if you can't pass this, you shouldn't be making decisions on what we do in math. And so we're making the choice to get rid of the math program we're currently using, and we're going to get what's called, they, they, they said, a teacher-proof textbook. Teacher-proof textbook. So you can see how that actually started to get us to think about resistance. Now, some of you are thinking, well, yeah, you should resist, right? That was awful that they did that and, and not have teacher voice and to shame teachers like that. Um, and so uh, that's what we did. We resisted and we ground that initiative to a halt and had us then have a voice and stop that. And so sometimes we see resistance as a, as a bad thing. But resistance can also be really good. Sometimes it just depends on the issue. And that's another way of looking at perspective taking. Resistance exists depending on the side of the issue you're on. And so some of you, when you hear that story of what we did to stop that change, you're like, yeah, good for you. But I'll tell you right now, some of the administrators in that district did not like that. We were called resistant teachers. My principal was called by the superintendent and was told, get Mike in line. 
That's what happened. So we were resistors on one side of the issue, but we were also allies for a lot of the teachers that, that wanted to stop this initiative in, the pla in place. And so, the, um, so Patrick Connolly from Williams-Sonoma talks about how his company wouldn't be where it is today if it wasn't for resistance. The people who resisted the changes they wanted to make actually helped shape their, their path. And although he, he credits that with their success, he also mentions they didn't like it when it happened. So the resistance is still not fun, but it doesn't mean it's always bad. Sometimes teachers who exhibit resistant behavior raise questions that are really important for us to consider. There's sometimes the people who are the devil's advocate who push back a little bit. And those of us, if you've been really excited about change, sometimes you're so excited that you don't see any of the pitfalls coming up. So you just plow ahead. You're so excited to have everyone on board with you. And you might miss something. So what we found is that sometimes teachers who are resisting raise critical issues that we should consider so that we don't fall into those pits as we make this change effort. So that's ways that we can handle encountering resistance. And I want to pivot now and have us think a little bit about what we can do uh, to, to, with the change process to actually make that easier and reduce or maybe even eliminate resistance altogether. And so to do that, we have to do a deep dive in psychology. We have to dig into our heads and understand why do humans behave the way they do when it comes to change. And, and there's a lot of things around this that we can start to unpack. And the very first one that I found fascinating is this idea of our lizard brain. If you're not familiar with the lizard brain, when we think about evolution, it's the, the part of our brain that, that lizards have. It's the, it's the, the fight or flight. It's the, it's the part of our brain that, that governs our safety. So long time ago, when we were at risk of being run down by predators and, and it was a much dangerous time to be a human, much more dangerous time to be a human, we had this, our brains evolved to protect us. So that if we were in a dangerous situation like this, that we would get a burst of adrenaline that would allow us to have the, the speed to run away or the drive to turn around and fight, that fight or flight response. Well, the interesting thing with our brains is that although our society evolved and we, I don't think anyone here got run down today by an animal or anything on the way here, I hope not, but, but we still have that piece of our brain. And the funny thing is, because it still exists, it, will, it, it triggers from the weirdest things. So society is very different now. And, and what happens is a simple thing like a threat to your status will trigger the fight and flight in some people. If they feel like their status is being challenged, embarrassment will trigger flight or f fight or flight in people. Um, sometimes that's where anxiety disorders come from. So there's a trigger out there that then gives someone this burst of adrenaline and, and it causes them to act in a certain way. And so one thing that you can remember is if you're in a situation with a parent, administrator, a teacher who's exhibiting really rough resistant behavior. It's like Sam coming in and saying that rude thing about um, the change that we were doing. Uh, if I step outside myself and don't think of that as a shot at me, and instead I realize that Sam's having a primitive brain moment. And I'm not saying he's primitive, I'm saying he's having a primitive brain moment, which means that he's reacting to something and, and that's, his, that's, how, that's the behavior. And when you step outside like that, you start to realize that you're, you're almost immune to the, whatever they're saying because you understand where it's coming from and so you can sort of move away and let it sort of fly by you. Um, it's hard to do, but if you could step outside of that rude behavior, that aggressive behavior and recognize that, it makes it a lot easier for, that to, for you to remain calm. And that's a huge piece. You want to learn to, to position yourself to respond versus react because they're reacting. Their, their brain's been triggered, so they're reacting. If you don't then also react, then you can de-escalate any kind of situation and have that be um, a much more productive experience for both of you. So that's the first part. We're going to do a deeper dive now into the brain. And I'm going to use this book that I absolutely love. I absolutely recommend it to everybody here if you do. It doesn't matter what role you're in. If you're not familiar with Chip and Dan Heath, I'm a huge fan of them. Their work has so many applications to education. And this particular book, Switch, How to Change Things When Change is Hard, is amazing. And if you're a teacher, coach, it doesn't matter. You're, you'll find it really useful. They have a great way, an analogous way to think about change efforts. So what they say is that our brains have two minds, basically. There's two parts of our brains that, are, that, that govern our behavior. And one of them is an elephant. And the other one is the rider that sits on top of the elephant. So I'm going to explain what this, this analogy, how it, what it means here. But if you imagine that inside all of us right now is an elephant with a rider sitting on top. The elephant 
is the emotional part of our brain. It's the heart. It's the limbic system. It's, it's, the, the, it's where our decisions come from here, our heart there. So the strengths of our emotional part of our brain is it gives us our drive, our motivation. It gives us resolve and energy and effort to do something. And so anytime you, feel them, you felt empowered to do something, it's because your elephant's been woken up. It's, a, it's active. But it doesn't, it doesn't mean it's in, it, it doesn't have weaknesses. The elephant's, oops, the elephant's weaknesses are that it can be stubborn. It can dig its heels in. Sometimes it can be frightened and skittish, uh, lazy, and even unruly. Sometimes our elephant can be out of control and hard to, it, it, it's harder for the rider to rein in. And so we have to recognize that our brains will do that. The emotional part of our brains when we're reacting, um, either react in a great way or a not so great way. And the other part of the brain is our rider. That's the rational part of our brain, the neocortex. So what this is, is it governs our planning, our organization, uh, logistics, problem solving. Our rider is so good at looking at information and figuring out what the right course of action is. But also, the rider has its weaknesses too. So one big one is that it overanalyzes information. That we may find ourselves with decision paralysis. Where you want to make a choice, but it's like, where do we go to eat? Well, we could go here, or we could go there. I, I don't know. What about this? And what do you like? And how many of you have ever had that where you can't make a, yeah, right? All the time. Probably here, right? When you're thinking, what are you going to eat tonight? And we start going through, well, there's all these possibilities. What can we do? That's what happens with our rider, right? It also can be exhaustible. We can exhaust our rider because that analysis is tiring. Our cognitive load can only handle so much of that. And so we have these two pieces happening here. We have the, the framework here where we have an, uh, the, the elephant, we have the rider. So in a situation here, if you think of a change effort that might happen. So for instance, maybe you have a heart attack, right? A tra like you, but you survive, you're okay, you have a heart attack though. That's going to make you feel something. Any kind of health crisis really wakes you up, right? So you might say, oh my God, that heart attack was so scary. It's time to make some changes. So that's what your elephant knows it needs to make a change. So now we activate the rider. So the rider's going like, to think logically, what can we do? Well, you know what? We've got to lose weight. Nothing but clean eating from now on. So we're good. So we've got the elephant going in the right direction. We've got the rider having a plan of where we're going to head. And that's fine. Change happens then. But what happens if the elephant and the rider disagree. Okay, so what if the rider says, hey, listen, I said only clean eating from now on, but the elephant's like, no, it's Girl Scout cookie season. What's gonna happen? Every single time, every single time the elephant wins, right? And all of you know that. All of you have had times where you've wanted to make some kind of change. You wanted to stop drinking soda. You wanted to stop, uh, uh, you wanted to exercise more. Uh, you want to read more. Any of these things, and then somehow your elephant just decides it wants to do something else, and it overrides the rider. That's what happens. That's with Girl Scout cookies. It's the time that we decide we're going to just binge watch Netflix, or we don't do laundry. Like those choices we make, that's your rider and elephant not agreeing. And so that's a key piece of this. So what we have to do as coaches, as teachers, if we want to affect change, we need to appeal to these parts of the brain. But if we only approach one way, and one of the things that we do oftentimes in education is we focus on just the rider. So if we just give large, logical arguments to people for why they should change and, and cite research and give them articles to read and everything, that's great, right? But the problem is, if that's all we do, then we're going to get clarity without motivation. So they'll know they want to change. And we've all seen this, right? Like we know it's great to jog, right? It's, it's good for us to do that. Doesn't mean that we want to do it. But we, we, and so there's that part of our brain that we know this is good for us. But we need to also think about our elephant. But you can't just focus on the elephant. So if you motivate people, but you don't give them any kind of guidance at all, then you get motivation without direction. And so you, that's what happens a lot of times in professional learning. We bring in a great speaker, get everyone all fired up and motivated, right? And then we send them off with no support. So they're excited. Oh, we need to change math. And they go back in the classroom and they're like, now what? I, what am I supposed to do first? What am I supposed to do second? And so that doesn't work either. We have to appeal to both. Both the rider and elephant because the rider provides the planning and direction. Elephant provides the energy. Now there's a third part of this framework, which is the path. And the path is the environment that you're on. And so we have, uh, it could be a classroom, a school, a district, whatever the environment is, uh, we have a rider and elephant navigating this path. And so the directions that we have, if we want to affect change really well, is we need to direct the rider, 
So we have to direct people's riders. We need to motivate their elephants. And we need to shape the path. We need to make that path crystal clear for them and make it easier for them to make that change. So we're going to look at some examples of what, how you do that. And to do this, when I started my investigations on the change process and resistance, I went to Twitter because it's just a great group of people out there that we can leverage. And I just asked questions about, were you ever resistant to change? And I wanted to hear what they said. And what's interesting is I got lots and lots of responses to this, hundreds of responses. And they all fell into either rider issues, path issues, or elephant issues. And so I'm, I'll put some of the tweets up as we go through each of the categories here. So let's begin with direct the rider. So what if your teacher that you're thinking about has rider issues, that they, they just they need help up here versus here? What can we do? One of the suggestions they talk about is that we can find the bright spots. And so they define bright spots um, in two different ways. So one way is to find what's working and clone it. So if you see places in the school where the change is happening really well, find out what's causing that change and replicate it. But the other way of looking at bright spots has to do with another human tendency that we all have. So it's called positive-negative asymmetry. What that means, is we all do this, is this glass half empty kind of way of looking at things. Uh, it turns out that we as humans tend to put more emphasis on the negative in situations than the positive. And to, to make my point with this, think about a time that you either had parent-teacher conferences or evaluations, that, like you got evaluated. And let's say 19 of the parents that you met with said you are the best teacher their child's ever had. And one said, meh. Right? What do you think about for two weeks after that? Every time, yeah, meh, every time. I can't believe that. What did I do? Why don't they like me? We focus on that even though 19 people, 19 groups of parents said they loved us. That's, that's positive negative asymmetry. And when teachers are changing, they often focus on the negative things, the things that they can't do. And so when you're starting to coach people or you're, you're working with parents and like they start to see what's wrong with things, they focus on the negative and not the positive. So what we can do is coach people to start finding the things that they're doing right. And it might be the smallest thing that they did. Like, I noticed that you had the kids come to the rug today. Everything else was like top down, you just lectured them for an hour. But you got them out of their seats, right? That was really great. So when you do that, you start to change the way people start seeing themselves. And they start to, it, you're basically changing their frame. The frame is the way that we look at the situation. And, and people who have a negative frame, you can change that frame for them. Okay, and we need to change that frame for people. So that's a way to get some people to start noticing that there's a little thing that they're doing right. That gives them a little bit of, of, of direction of what they can keep doing. Um, the other piece is finding what's working and clone it, cloning it. And so if you have someone who's doing a great job facilitating number talks in the class, what is it that makes that happen? So it might be that she has a list of questions on a sticky note that are really open-ended, that help her to remember how to push the thinking forward. And it may look when you visit her classroom that she's just a natural at that, but she may have this great resource that no one else knows about. So if that's the thing that's making it happen there, let's clone it because that's what's gonna help other people also in this. So another way that we can start directing people's riders is to script the critical moves. So what this is, is if you think big picture, um, like we, it's, it's too much. We need to actually break any kind of change effort down small. So uh, if we have a goal, like do number talks with your students, that's too big. What does that mean? What does that look like? I don't know where to start. It's a big change effort, so I don't know how to do that. Well, what if we script the small steps and we give them just some resources to say, here are the six things that you could do. Get this in your head and if you, you have it right with you if you want in the morning. Read it while you're doing the number talk with students. It doesn't matter. We're going to break this down for you so that you don't have to worry about all the little details. Remember, the rider gets exhausted. So the more the rider has to figure things out on their own, the more it's going to get tired and not change. So if we can find ways to keep the rider in the game, this is going to work. Finally, pointing to the destination. That if we have a big change effort, which can be overwhelming, it's helpful to see the end, to know where we're going and why it's worth it. That's going back to Jim Knight's thing. We're, we're building the value here. Um, and we, want to, we, we need to do that. And I'm going to tell a story that has nothing to do with math, but I needed this for a huge change effort we have. Uh, my wife and I, uh, I bought my grandparents' house, and we decided we we're going to update the kitchen. And we had a contractor come in, and he had a great plan for it and everything, and he did the demo, which is amazing. This is actually it. This is the house. And he got to this point, and then he had a, a life challenge. 
and he told us that he just needs to figure things out and he can't do this anymore. I'm not kidding. Yeah, he did this. And we had family coming into town and stuff, and that's what our kitchen looked like. And he was our general contractor, and he had everything lined up, and that all those contractors were subcontractors were gone. Yeah, you can imagine right now that we're overwhelmed. And so how in the world are Megan and I going to actually get this house underway? So what was really cool is that we worked with a company that helped us. They actually created a computer model of what the kitchen should look like. And we hung those up all over just to help us remember that all those days that we fight with the contractors and try to get a plumber and these people will show up, that we looked at that picture to say it's going to be there someday. That was what we needed to have the resolve, and, and we eventually got there. So it, it came out okay, right? It took three more months than it was supposed to, and we had to eat microwave food forever, but it worked. It was good. So think about this for a moment. Is Does the person you're thinking about, does the teacher, parent, et cetera, have a, have a rider issue? And, and think about ways that you might address it. So that's rider issues. What about elephant issues? What if people have motivation issues? Well, the first advice they give is to find the feeling that you gotta make people feel something, okay? Knowing it's not enough, you have to feel it if you wanna change. And so I'm gonna share another personal story with me that you might all not know, which is that for a period of time in my life, I had a Coke problem, okay? So I was up to like six or seven cans a day, and, and I'm not kidding, I drank an obscene amount of Diet Coke. And, and I knew it's not good for you. Everyone told me. My, my wife hated the fact that I drank that much Coke. And, and so I've read articles on it. I know what soda does to you. I know all the stuff that's in it. And I wasn't going to change. It didn't matter. Because I, even though I knew it, I wasn't feeling anything. Until I saw this infographic. And I know this feels like, I f it feels like with this infographic that there's, um, I'm actually hitting the rider here. But when I read this, it actually made me feel something. And it's, this was a couple years ago now. And I'll, I'm proud to say, actually, I have not had a single Coke since. I've, I've, I've given up soda. And, and it's because I actually felt something that made me want to change. Well, we could do that in math too. So this is actually a scene from uh, Mount Holyoke College. This is where uh, we run a grad program, and this is our grad program. This is two summers ago, and there's a beautiful moment happening right here. Uh, we had had this conversation about the role of visual representations and, and, and whether or not we teach kids standard algorithms or that we need to build uh, a, a solid understanding from, from concrete and representational before we get into the abstract. It was a great debate, but we actually had disagreement in the class. And what you're seeing right now is some students who are on campus, and on that iPad are actually some of our other students who are in Spain and Florida and all over. So they're having this live moment, and they're working in base five. And what you're seeing right now is this moment where uh, one of the participants in, on the iPad there just saw that all of the stuff that works in base 10 works in base five with these little blocks. She's using base five blocks. And she actually said in this moment, shut up. And, and we, I snapped the picture right when everyone started to laugh. But it was a moment of clarity for that whole group that all of a sudden, like, we had talked about the role of representations and, and, concrete, repre and concrete models, all of these things. But that moment when they experienced it as a learner just gelled it. And people started saying afterwards, we had middle school teachers saying, we need these in our classroom, not base five blocks, but base 10 blocks. We need more visual representations. So we could talk to them until we're blue in the face about all the reasons why. But when we help them to feel it, that's what gets that elephant going in the right direction. Now, the other thing with an elephant, we know the elephant can be lazy sometimes. It doesn't want to do big change. So let's shrink it. Let's shrink that change and make it easier for uh, people to see it, uh, that they can actually do that. Break it down so it's not spooking our elephant. And again, another life example is if you have any place in your house that is messy, that needs organization, a garage, a shed, whatever, it's so overwhelming of where to start. And so there's something called the five-minute clean that you don't actually start to say, I'm going to clean the garage today. You say, I'm going to clean the garage for five minutes today. And if you, all you do is five minutes and you walk away, you did something. It's easy to clean a garage for five minutes. But what do you think happens when you start a five-minute clean? You keep going, right? You, it's just, and it, it might be 20 minutes. You might do the whole thing. Sometimes it just helps to frame the change in a smaller way so it's not overwhelming there. And that's exactly the way that we can do this in a classroom. So instead of saying, we're going to make every lesson student-centered and actively engage everyone in the class, which is such a big monumental thing that we're asking, uh, what if we say, facilitate one number, walk, one number talk per week? One, one change, right? So for Sam, we were telling him to do it every day. 
when we said, hey, what if you just did one a week? He did. One a week. And one a week became two. And then it went from two to five. It did, I would like to say three, four, five. It, didn't, it went from two to five. He just needed that little bit of a start. And doing one a week was, was easy to do. So the last one to motivate your elephants is grow your people. Cultivate a sense of identity and instill a growth mindset in people. And so when I think about growing people, I'm talking about uh, finding the folks that, that identify with this kind of math teaching. And they're all in your school. You have your pockets of people. And, and there's, it's infectious as we start to do that. Uh, build them. Help them see what it's like to be learners in math. I think the biggest thing that happened to me in mathematics was when I realized that I didn't need to know everything and I could identify myself as a learner, as a teacher. That's huge. When I realized I didn't have to have all the answers, I was more open for my own learning and it made a big difference in there. So help them realize that as a teacher, you're not supposed to know everything. You're supposed to really be an expert in how to learn and the way we become an expert in how to learn is we become learners ourselves. So if we can give people chances to do math and to, to get together and problem solve and work on problems together, anticipate what kids might do, but stay in that space as a learner, that develops an identity as math learners all the time. That's what we're trying to get at. So now think about your resistant, the teacher who's exhibiting resistant behavior. Do they have elephant issues? And how might you address those? Now that we've got those two, let's look at the final one, the path. So you have your environment. We're going to shape our path now so that we can start to uh, make the environment much more conducive to the change effort we want to support. So the first suggestion is that we need to tweak our environment. So we've got this place. Um, let's make it more conducive to the change we want. So if a situation changes, behavior changes. So change the situation. So sometimes you don't have to work on the person. If you change the environment, the behavior may change. So we think about this now in the business world. They've got this down. They shape the path so well because a store's, if you think of a store's goal, their main motivation is to make more money. They want to make you buy more things. And the way they can do that is to make the shopping experience so much easier. And you can see today, like, we have this, this uh, notion of, like, you can go to a regular checkout and stuff. That's one way you can do it. But we now see that there's Amazon Go stores. I don't know if you've seen these, but that this idea that there's no checkout at all. You just go in, you pick out some things, and then you leave, and the technology takes care of everything else. Think of how much easier it is. They've shaped that store's environment now to make it easier to achieve the goal that they wanted. So we can do that also in the classroom. So if one of our goals, and my goal for Sam, was to actually use more visual representations, and he didn't have them out, if to use them in his class, you'd have to go to a closet, take out papers, take out all these things, and build out the, bring out these bins. Well, we worked on shaping the environment. We tweaked it a bit so everything was easier and accessible and out for kids uh, right from the onset there. And those little things, uh, with everything that Sam had going on in his life, actually made it easier for him. I actually helped take some burdens off of his plate, and, and he was appreciative of that. And that started to help us form a better relationship at that point. And it was one-on-one, -on -one, so there was no posturing or anything like that. He was able to say, yeah, this is really cool. This is really helpful. Thank you. So another thing we can do with our path, uh, shaping the path, is to build habits. Habits are what govern all of us. If we didn't have habits, our whole minds would be focused on every little thing that we do. Get up. How do I put my shoes on? You have to think about how to do that. How do I put my socks on? All these things that, that we do without even thinking. If we didn't have habits, we'd, be, we'd have to think through every little step. So when behavior becomes habitual, it doesn't tax the rider. That's why we create routines. That's why we, we try to simplify our lives. If you know anything about Steve Jobs, uh, he wasn't known for his fashion sense there. In fact, he wore pretty much the same thing all the time. Why did he wear the same outfit every day? One less thing to think about, right? One less decision you have to make because you're not trying to coordinate and stuff. Like, I, ha I, I have to do that every day. So my socks actually match my shirt and all that. So I'm not Steve Jobs. So I actually have a lot of decisions before I walk out the door. But I can get that. I appreciate that. It's pretty easy. Uh, but if we think about our brains, we can handle change to a certain level, right? So we have routines. That doesn't tax our brain at all. So we, we're just used to doing things like the morning routine when kids come in or how we handle homework, all of these things. But when we add a change, our mental energy starts to get tapped. But we're good. We can handle We can roll with it a little bit. But over time, when we start dumping more stuff onto teachers, that change uh, overwhelms us. We lose our mental energy. We are now exhausted. And, and that's a thing that we have to think about is how do we 
set habits for teachers so that they can make this change effort easier. So one thing I did in this school to help the teachers is we wanted them actually being out with the students. As they worked with students, we wanted them to observe and listen to student thinking. And one way we did that was by creating these recording grids for them where every day before they taught a lesson, the only thing they had to do, they actually had the students' names already typed in there. But across the top, they would just put what the learning targets were, um, any indicators that they were looking for. Uh, what we were trying to do is help them pay attention to where their, what their goals were and to give them a lens on what to look for when they were teaching. And so this just became a habit. It, it, like the beginning, it was new, but we worked it up. So that's how they approach every single lesson is they would start with that. And then they'd carry that around with them and take great notes on students as they work through there. It made it easier for that. And Sam started using this one as well. Last thing that we could do for our shaping the path is rally your herd. Uh, behavior's contagious, so help it spread. Find the folks that are doing this work and loving it and, and get get around them and start building a coalition, build people who are fired up about this work. Because when people see this happening, then it's, it, you can't help but go that way. When I first started doing professional learning as a participant, I remember working with this group of teachers that all had this, they were so excited about math problems. And I remember the first time I like worked with, I went there and I'm like, why are you all excited? It's just math. And, but they were like giddy about like, oh, this is such a cool problem. And, and I found though that in that day, by the afternoon, I was like, I get it. Like, I was in it. Like, I'm a giddy about problems. Because we follow, we, we, we kind of uh, went in Rome. We kind of right, rise to that uh, expectation there. And so if you can find the people that, that help push you and get you excited about this, uh, do that. And so think now about your situations. Uh, do you have path issues? And if you have path issues, what can you do to address those? So we now have three ways in which we can, we can work with change and making it easier. We shape that path for people, we motivate their elephants, and we give them some direction. We direct that rider so that the change effort can actually work through without much complication. Now in closing, there are three surprising things about change that, they, uh, that sort of surround this book switch. And I'm going to talk about each one, and it'll situate us thinking about the change process differently as we think about it. So the first is a story I'm going to tell you about my family. So in our household, I have four kids one on the way, uh, so soon to be five. And, um, and so we have a, a cereal problem in my house. Uh, we don't actually buy sugar cereal. My wife and I, like, they have fairly healthy cereal, I guess if you can call that healthy cereal. But it's, uh, the kids love it. We go through so many boxes a week. It was a real problem. And we started realizing, like, why, like, it's, it's Wednesday and we're already out. And w what's going on here? Um, now, now, the cereal problem, like, for us, it's, like, it's, okay, they're eating fairly healthy cereal. One challenge is that my mom, whenever she has the kids sleeping over, she gets all the sugar stuff and then they come home with it. And so, and she loves having the grandkids over, so like it's, it's a thing, right? Which by the way, can I just make a complaint for a second? Because uh, how many of you also have parents that when you were a kid growing up, they wouldn't do that, right? But as grandparents, it's like, oh, when did Nana become cool, right? So this is, uh, it's, it's funny. So anyway, whether it's sugar cereal or regular cereal, we go through a lot. Well, in the book Switch, they talked about this experiment where they were giving moviegoers popcorn. And they gave some of them popcorn in a small container. And they gave some of the people popcorn in a large container. Now, to control this, the, the experiment, they actually made sure the popcorn was stale. It was nasty. It actually squeaked when they ate it. And yeah, because they, they didn't want to have it be like where they thought, like, oh, it's really good popcorn, so that's why they ate, ate a lot. So, but they gave some people stale popcorn in a small container, some people stale popcorn in a large container. Who do you think ate more popcorn? The large container, right? That's what they found. Consistently, people ate more when it was in a larger container. Well, that's what happened in our house. We actually had, our cereal bowls, bowls were ginormous. And I don't know what's going on with bowls these days, but they're huge. You can't even get like small bowls these days. And, and so this is an action, this is from um, Michael O'Neill's blog where he's actually looking at serving sizes here. What you're seeing on, this, on the scale is the serving size of Fruity Pebbles on the right, 28 grams. That's what it looks like in the large bowl. So you can imagine people are going to fill that bowl. That's what my kids are doing. So this is also what, how many grams are in it when you fill the bowl up. So we have 82 grams now. So that was a huge issue. So what we did after reading Switch is we got rid of our big bowls and we, we totally, uh, the kids eat less cereal. They still eat cereal every day, but we go, we, it lasts the whole week. So that little thing that we did made a huge change. Now we just need to work on Nana, right? So she's, yeah, she's a little over the top of the cereal there. She's, but, but we'll work on that. 
So this is the first surprising thing about change. What looks like a people problem is often a situation problem. Think about that. What looks like a people problem is often a situation problem. So that's first surprise. Second surprise. Again, going back to my family. Allie, uh, she wanted to play in the band, and she wanted to play baritone sax. Um, the, the rule was, because the baritone sax costs a lot of money to rent, is that she had to practice. She had to guarantee that she was going to practice. And of course, she said she's going to do that. And of course, you know what teenagers are like. She doesn't. It just sat on her floor all the time. She didn't practice. And so I was, we're trying to figure out ways we can motivate her and all of this. And then after reading Switch, again, I looked at Allie's schedule. So this is like, she, she's like an overachiever. So this is what her schedule typically looks like. It's absolutely jam-packed because she does drama club and she does sports and all this stuff. So just looking at the schedule, you see no time at all for, for practicing. So what we did is we looked at places where we could tweak it. So we tweaked her schedule and we found places where she could practice saxophone. We also built in downtime because I'm worried about like, her overscheduling herself. And so then she started practicing. So this is the second surprising thing about change. What looks like laziness is often exhaustion. We want to call people lazy, but it turns out that they're just really tired. And Allie was just really tired. So the third surprising thing about change is, I'm going to talk again about the kids. So one other issue we had is them keeping the rooms clean. Uh, we found it just was constant. And we would tell them, like, hey, listen, go upstairs and clean your room. And they'd come down two minutes later and say, it's done. Does that happen to you all? Right? And then you go up and it's like they put one thing away. It's like, no, clean your room. Right? They go up and take another thing put it away. Nothing's happening. So... We decided, again, following Switch's lead here, is to make a morning checklist. If they want to use any technology in the morning before school, all of these things had to happen. And uh, it was great because the younger kids loved it. The middle schoolers thought, and the high schoolers thought, like, we're, we're babies. Like, we don't want this. I said, well, if you don't want it, then do it on your own, then you don't need it. Both ways, it worked. But what this is, the third surprising thing about change, is what looks like resistance is often a lack of clarity. People just don't know what they're supposed to do. So clean your room is pretty vague, right? Put all the things away. Put all your clothes away is much more, uh, much more specific. And so I'm going to leave you with one final thought around change and around this effort because it's still not easy. I've given you some things to think about, given you th ways to reframe resistance and work with people, but it's still challenging, and they're still going to have those primitive brain moments where they lash out at you. So this is my last piece of advice for all of you is the work is hard, and just remember Q-tip, okay? Remember Q-tip. And, and this is the way I help you remember this, which is quit taking it personally. Being a coach, being a teacher, being a human in a way is, is hard. We take so many things personally that we don't need to. Step outside of that. Realize that the reason people are behaving the way they're doing is because they're reacting, not responding. Elevate yourself so you can respond rather than react and you're going to handle resistance much easier. So thank you all for your time, uh, and have a great conference.